thanks very much indeed to Lady for that generous introduction. I know quite a few people who regard me as a national treasure. There we go. Um, what I want to do this evening, um, well, first of all, thanks for the invite to come along. Uh, it's a delight to be able to get out there uh, for a brief hour. Um, what I want to do this evening is just talk about a little bit to begin with about my own background and why I became interested in this topic. Um, Moving on to uh, review how we got to where we got to uh, in relationship to, to land rights in Scotland, a bit of um, history. And then a series of kind of randomly selected really sort of examples uh, about why this all matters in real life uh, today, before concluding with some thoughts about um, uh, democracy and power. So this is kind of quite a wide-ranging, very general talk, so I'm not going to get into any detailed specifics because this is quite a wide-ranging um, topic. Um, and uh, I put together principally to entertain you um, and inform, uh, of course, um, and stimulate thoughts about um, why this might matter in your own lives, in your own uh, area of work, in ways perhaps you hadn't um, thought of um, previously. So to begin with, when I, well, when I still was at school, when I left school, I, I worked during the summer as a stalker at Billy. Um, this is me. Um, um, some time ago now, with my pony branding, um, and my job was to take stacks off the hill that being shot. So I was working um, on a sporting estate, in the course of which I met lots of interesting people, including the royal family, um, the De Beers Diamond family, uh, the earrings, the bankers, uh, uh, etc. And I had long and interesting chats with them um, on the hill. And began to appreciate that um, there was a lot of interesting stuff sitting behind the innocuous. Uh, activity uh, of deer stalking. When I left school, I worked in forestry and um, I was uh, destroying the works in Aberfeldy and planting spruce. I uh, didn't like that, I thought something was wrong with it, so I went to university to study forestry. And when I was at university, um, a huge controversy erupted over planting trees in the so called full country of Cape Ness and Sutherland, and this is an aerial view of the so called full country. Uh, now I'm glad to say I'm not campaigning against this, I'm glad to say I'm not vindicated because we're uh, having spent millions of pounds of public money planting these trees and we're spending millions of pounds of public money to rip them all out. And it is one of the largest carbon sinks uh, in Europe, um, these, these deep treatments. So the value of them for carbon storage is now recognised and the value of them in natural heritage terms in terms of the habitat they provide, particularly for birds like red fruit and black fruit and diverse. Uh, is now recognised. In fact, there's a campaign to, to make them a world heritage site. But at that time, this was cheap land, and people like Howard Higgins and Terry Wogan, uh, Sherwood Porter, uh, were being advised to invest money to buy land in the far north of Scotland and plant it with trees. Uh, they got tax breaks for this, quite generous tax breaks, and they got public money in terms of grants. And when I was at the university, the chief executive of the company that was principally responsible for this company called Fountain Forestry, came to give us a lecture, and I don't really remember much of the lecture, it was pretty boring, but at the end of it, I asked him, why is the government spending millions of pounds in tax breaks for rich people in London to buy land in Caithness to plant trees? Why doesn't it use money that's for going in tax revenues uh, to pay grants to the farmers and landowners who already own that land to plant trees? I couldn't understand why he wanted to plant trees, and you asked Colin Cadigans to do it. Um, I don't remember the answer, but afterwards my professor pulled me to one side and said he didn't think it was a good idea to ask such a political controversial question. <laughs> <laughs> I was genuinely not aware that this was political controversial, but quickly became aware that it was. And as soon as you ask questions about land and power and money, um, some folk get uncomfortable, and I enjoyed that feeling of making people <laughs> continue to ask those um, questions. Um, I also read quite extensively at university. Um, You'll know who this is, of course. Um, I want to check out. Tom Johnson. Tom Johnson, that's right. Uh, he wrote a wonderful book called uh, History of the Working Classes in Scotland. Um, he was a very keen historian. Um, and he's got a chapter in that book called The Reading of the Common Lands, uh, in which he talks about um, the common lands of the royal boroughs, the extensive commons of the villages, hamlets, pasturages, and grazings, run like tenancies. He concludes we shall be rather under than overestimating the common acreage in the latter part of the 16th century, it fully won half the entire area of Scotland. In other words, half of Scotland was held in some form of common ownership or common usage. Now, it was clear to me when I read that 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 is no longer the case, um, and so I was intrigued as to what happened uh, in the intervening uh, years. So the people like Tom Johnson, who 
um, delved quite deeply into Scottish history in a way that some professional historians now don't bother doing um, uh, that uh, uh, got me on this journey. I then read other books uh, like Who in Scotland by John McEwan. Um, I was involved in big environmental campaigns to uh, restore places like Glenfeshie. Uh, we highlighted this as an example of Northern government's arrogance and hypocrisy when they went to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, demanding a country like Brazil stop deforesting the Amazon. Um, uh, and yet, we're presiding over rampant deforestation uh, in places like uh, Glenfeshie and right across the north, uh, Canada, uh, Russia and Scandinavia. So what is all this uh, about? What are we talking about? Well, um, we're talking about land tenure, so we're talking about the basic rules by which land is held. Uh, we're talking about land ownership, so that's more than just land tenure, that's more than about the laws, that's about the characteristics of the people and the institutions that actually, in fact, do own land, because, of course, it could be myriad, or it could be all sorts of permutations could emerge. Uh, we're talking about land use, that's how land is actually being used. Um, and we're talking about change, we're talking about the potential to change the way British land uh, is owned and used, and that's the process of land uh, reform. So fundamentally, as Mary said in her introduction, this is about power. It's about how power is defined, um, how it's uh, distributed, um, and how it's exercised. In fact, uh, one of the quotes I often refer to is a quote by um, Tony Benn, I think, during the debate on the Maastricht Treaty in the 1980s in the House of Parliament, where he said, if anyone claims to have any power, ask them these five questions. Uh, what power do you have? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And finally, and he said, if you can't answer this final question, we don't live in a democracy, how can we get rid of you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and those are the five questions that are at the heart of any system of governance. Who are you? What power do you have? Who do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And how can we get rid of you? Um, and that applies as much to land as it does to any other um, aspect <coughs> of um, public life. So land reform um, is fundamentally about changing the relationship between land and society. Uh, in my view, it's got three principal components. Uh, the first is a legal relationship, that's land tenure, so that's the basis on which you own property, whether it's a house or a farm, the basis on which you occupy a factory, or the basis on which you drive along the road uh, as a public highway. Those are all aspects of land tenure. Uh, the law relating to property rights and how they're uh, defined. It's a fiscal relationship, uh, and that's to do with um, taxation in relationship to property. We'll come back to that later. And it's also a political relationship. That's about decision making in areas like, for example, planning. Uh, you cannot do what you like with your property. Uh, we nationalised development rights in 1947 and said that if you want to change the way you use your property, you must ask for permission. Um, uh, public access rights, obviously, um, environmental regulation, these are all political uh, relationships uh, that we have superimposed on the system of property rights to say, you know, if you want to build a house, you need permission, or you're not allowed to pull that barn, uh, that river, uh, etc. So, and the Land Reform Review Group, which was set up by the Scottish Government in 2014, is a very good report, actually, if any of you want to further your interest in this topic, recommend it. It defined land reform as measures that modify or change the arrangements governing the possession and use of land in Scotland in the public interest. So, uh, and also, uh, land is not just dry stuff, um, it's also wet stuff. So, um, the sovereign territory of Scotland extends to 12 miles out from the coast, that was in the territorial waters, that's legally Scotland. So, 54% of Scotland is underwater, under salt water. Um, and then we've got the 200 mile limit, which is a, another limit, and that's delineated in these uh, yellow lines here. Um, and that's the exclusive economic zone. So for, within that area, the United Kingdom has got certain exclusive rights, principally to mine minerals, etc. Uh, that has impact as well on, on fishing rights, etc. as well. So it's flat, it covers the entire earth, even the high seas are governed by land tenure. So the high seas are governed by the UN Convention on the High Seas, which defines who has rights in the high seas. So everywhere on the surface of the earth is governed by some system of land tenure. And then it was up and down as well. So if you own property, typically many people will here will own their own home, I would assume. Um, and if your home is a, a square house, um, sitting on land, maybe with really a garden, you don't want just own that square. You actually own all the land down to the centre of the earth. So you own an interactive pyramid. And you also own all the land uh, heading up to um, the top of the sphere, actually. Um, so you have an inverted pyramid, it's actually your ownership rights. And that, of course, matters for things like minerals, 
So who's got the right to, uh, and this will come up in the fracking debate, who has got the right um, to, to, to send whatever you do when you frack a few kilometres down? Um, and in Scotland, those are property rights. So if anyone actually does want to frack in Scotland, they're either going to have to, park, they're either going to, have to ask 20,000 people living in centres a year in Falkirk for permission, or they're going to pass a law nationalising rights to kilometres down, uh, which is not uh, likely. And obviously up in the air as well, the civil, civil aviation began. Uh, if you wanted to fly from London to Edinburgh before the Civil Aviation Act of 1922, I think it was, you had to actually ask permission of every single landowner uh, over whose land you were going to fly. And again, so that was nationalised. Um, so land rights are vertical uh, as well. And they also actually extend to outer space, so I'm a, I don't own any property myself. I do own an acre of land on the moon. <laughs> and this is my title deed in Quadrant Charlie. Now, actually, uh, the question as to whether I do own the moon is an interesting question that could occupy us all evening, but fundamentally, the UN Treaty on the Outer Space, it's the normal uh, shorthand for the 1977 Treaty, that was passed in order to prevent militarization of space during the Cold War. We didn't want weapons in space. And it was its principal uh, reason. So, actually, it prohibits states from appropriating celestial bodies. It's illegal for the UK or France or the state of the United States to claim ownership uh, of any body um, in, in space. Uh, that doesn't mean to say it's illegal or unlawful or prohibited for any individual party. <coughs> and so this came to light first in a big way when the Schumacher probe, which went up to this asteroid called Eros, um, probably 20 years ago now, um, died, the, the, the satellite, the, the probe, this battery ran out and it, it died. Um, meanwhile, a company in California had registered a claim to the ownership of Eros in the Californian um, courts, <laughs> and they sent an invoice to NASA uh, for parking charges. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this might be quite funny, and it is quite funny, but this is the next frontier of property rights, because there are companies like Elon Musk, SpaceX, who now lease one of the space um, platforms at Cape Canaveral, obviously launching rockets and stuff, and out in space, in these asteroids, are precious metals in abundance, um, available potentially with the right technology uh, to mine and bring to Earth in a way that's obviously far less environmentally damaging than mining cobalt and nickel and uh, platinum and titanium and lithium and all things we rely on in modern life on, on planet Earth. So this is important stuff, but it's a little bit of a, a, a diversion. So to, to the history, because I wanted to understand how we got to where we got to, and um, I think it's always important to try and understand how we got to where we got to, uh, as a matter of context in any field of life, say any field of Public policy. So in my, in my book, The Food of the I talk about six land grabs. Um, this is a very populist term, but fundamentally this is about, you know, way, way long time ago, there were no property rights. Property rights are a modern concept. They didn't used to exist. There was, there was no such concept as owning the earth. It was just impossible uh, to imagine that. And today, in Aboriginal society, it's still impossible. And there's good reason for that it's impossible. You cannot own the earth. Um, but as societies evolved, I wouldn't say developed, as societies evolved, as power structures became settled with settled agriculture, people began to claim exclusive rights over land. Um, and so in Scotland, the first big land grab, I suppose, was feudalism, um, which was not the responsibility of Robert Bruce um, pictured here. Um, it was introduced by King David I in the 11th century. And feudalism is a concept whereby the crown owned everything, and everybody was a vassal of the crown. Uh, but the reason I picture Bruce here, of course, is that Bruce didn't fight the Battle of Bannockburn to liberate Scotland or to make an independent country. He couldn't care about that. He fought because he was a powerful noble, and if he won the battle, he got the crown, and that was a valuable thing. He owned Scotland. So that's what drove the nobility in those days. It wasn't any sense. Of course, I'm confidently saying this, and I haven't spoken to the guy about it. <laughs> um, um, in terms of how the nobility behaved in the medieval era, these were not about kind of independence campaigns you might think of politically today. These were naked power grabs. And if his interest would be better served staying as a vassal of Edward I, he'd have done that. Um, as it happens, he was successful, he won the Battle of Bannockburn, and Scotland literally became his. He owned it. And with that came fantastic amounts of power that he could use on a personal basis to confer patronage on the people he supported and grant uh, field charters uh, to his supporters all around the country. And even at that time, these feudal charters could be revoked at any time. If you fell out with the king, the feudal charter was, was, was gone. Um, that then evolved. Of course, you could only revoke the feudal charter 
um, uh, on death. Uh, death in those days was easy to organize, so that didn't really happen <laughs> <laughs> very much. It then became heritable, and that's the start of the idea of modern property rights, and feudal charters became heritable, which is why land in law is called heritable property, and everything else, my pen, uh, is called movable property. So that was feudalism, uh, the first um, land grab. The second one is not much talked about or studied, and that's the impact of the Reformation in Scotland, which came late in 1560. But prior to 1560, the old cuck, uh, as I like to call it, was a substantial landowner. And this is Crossregal Abbey in uh, near, um, uh, trying to begin with M in Ayrshire. Mabel. Mabel, yes, sorry. Mabel. Um, and there's a famous story of the roasting of the abbot uh, here. It wasn't quite an abbot, it was a commendator. But the bottom line is that the church owned 95% of the county of Ayr. Um, and that wasn't untypical uh, in Scotland at the time. And the nobles coveted the lands of the church. They took it to what they'd get and try and do is get their relatives, their sons or their nephews in as what are called commendators. So they were the kind of chief executive of the abbey who looked after the finance and the legal side of things. Uh, and any abbey you go to in Scotland today will have a commendator's house. Um, and typically they began signing over charters to themselves and to their relatives, unbeknownst to the um, old brothers uh, in the abbeys. Um, and that was then fortified and turned into uh, um, made law as life rents and later feudal grants by law, uh, by parliament. So they basically stole the lands of the church. And a big motive for the Reformation came from the nobility who wanted the overthrow of the old church and the introduction of the new church so that they could get their hands on the valuable land of the church. So of course it was a, a Protestant uh, Reformation <coughs> by John Knox and people, but it was massively supported by the nobility. So that was the second uh, land grab. The third land grab was really the 17th century, the last time we had a Scottish Parliament, and it spent most of its time uh, passing laws to protect the rights of proprietors and devising new ways of killing Highlanders. Um, so at the beginning of the century, we had the 1617 Registers of Scotland Registry, <coughs> which introduced the Season Register, where property rights were recorded. <laughs> Scotland has one of the oldest, over 400 years now, one of the oldest property registers in the world. And that was introduced uh, in substantial part, actually, to overcome the difficulties of the Reformation, where people had been buying and selling the same piece of land to all sorts of different people. Uh, and people were fighting over who actually really owned it. So they said, well, fine, we'll set up a new system. You get your charter registered in the Register of Seasons, and it's registered in the Register of Seasons is yours. And if no one disturbs that for 20 years, that's called the prescriptive period, um, then the title is absolutely fortified. So it introduced a way of settling disputes about who owned land as much as anything else by giving what's called publicity, not in the modern sense, but giving publicity to people that could inspect the register, find out who owned it, and if someone owned the land that you thought was yours, well, that was tough. Um, and they essentially ended, uh, as with many other acts, the Act of Entail, for example, which allowed landowners to uh, have their land exempted from the claims of creditors. Um, was really, really important and only finally abolished um, uh, the last remnants of it only finally abolished in the Feudal Abolition Act in 2000. But the century ended by the 1695 Act for the Division of Commentaries, and that was Scotland's equivalent to the Enclosure Acts in England. Um, and that was a fourth land grant because every parish in Scotland had extensive common land. Um, and it passed an act that made it very, very easy for the heritors in the parish to go to the Sheriff Court. Uh, sue for a division, uh, there'd be a perambulation by the sheriff um, and uh, a couple of appointed uh, heritors. They'd make a plan, divide it all up, um, and the commons would disappear. Um, whereas in England, you had acts, plural of enclosure. So every single common in England had to have, and occasionally there were a number of commons lumped together, but typically each common had its own act. And acts of parliament take a while. Uh, and that's why there's somewhere in the region of 700,000 acres of common land still in England, uh, and virtually no acres of common land left in Scotland because we instituted a very simple process uh, of uh, division. Um, the 1695 Act um, allowed for the division, um, and it said for preventing the discords that arise about commentaries and the more easy and expedited side of the world and time coming, uh, etc. But it exempted the commentaries belonging to the king, so the crown commons were exempted. And the royal boroughs, that's important. So, in places like Glasgow, common land was exempted. You couldn't sue for division of common land in boroughs. Um, and today, when you explore land ownership, and this is just a random example um, in Perthshire, 
where I've identified an estate, a farm in green here, and another property in red. And those of you who have got good eyesight will see that in the middle of this is a very small triangle. And this is rare. Uh, one would normally expect either one of these landowners, whether they're entering the new land register, to sort of grab this quite and to say it's mine. I don't know who this is. Um, but in fact, uh, they didn't. Um, this is on the, what's called now the Cataract Trail, which is a popular walking trail, which is built around the droving roads. So this is a droving road, those um, diamond shapes. So this is a, 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 a droving stance. It's a grazing stance. This is a stance where cattle would be grazed overnight during the drive of the cattle from the highlands down to the markets and creek and fork areas. So these are the kind of waterway service stations um, of the day. Probably owned by the Crown. But today these little pieces of land are kind of ignored, forgotten about, and little known about. Um, and it's only when you begin to look around like this you begin to find them and they're interesting and I think they're worthy of uh, preservation and protection. Uh, and the fifth land grab was the commons in the boroughs. Um, and we couldn't institute a law to do this, but we did this through rampant municipal corruption and nepotism. Right there, where um, from 1493 until the 1853 Border Reform Act, town councils were not elected. Actually, in 1493, before that, there was an election. There was actually democracy. Really, really limited franchise, which is the Burgesses. But nevertheless, the town council was elected. Um, and the nobility um, decided this wasn't a good idea because their interests were being um, affected by this. And so they came to pass a law, say the Office of the Borough Act, saying we will abolish this um, system whereby we have these elections, and here's how we we'll do things in the future. And how we do things in the future is the old town council shall choose the new town council. And together they will appoint the new officers. So it was self-selection. One council selected the council for the next year, they selected it for the next year. And this led to rampant municipal corruption and nepotism, which Tony <coughs> Rooster did this very good report in 1832 uh, called the Municipal Corporations of Scotland Report, where a commission was set up by Parliament and went around Scotland investigating the affairs of the boroughs and reporting on that rampant nepotism and corruption. Uh, going to places like Fort Shows, um, the treasurer wasn't there. Where it was the treasurer and the treasurer's off to Glasgow we'll seeing his aunt will come back next week, come back next week. The treasurer's not there still. Where's the aunt? Where's he now? Goes off to work to see his other aunt. Um, you know, where are the books? And eventually they, they get some books, they get some accounts, uh, and they find that these have been concocted the day before the visit, uh, etc. So Scotland's towns, Scotland's boroughs were in the hands of uh, a clique um, who managed essentially to privatise a lot of the common lands uh, in Scotland's royal uh, boroughs. Um, but the other reason this didn't disappear completely was we had an Act of 1491, which is still in the statute book, uh, and that decrees and ordains that all the common good lands for the boroughs uh, be observed and kept for the common good of the town, and to be spent in common, uh, in common and necessary things for the borough by the advice of the town council. And this is the fundamental basis of our common good land today. Of course, Glasgow is most celebrated common lands of the, um, the um, park down by the river. What's it called? Glasgow Green. Um, and if you look at 1853, this is Irvine and Ayrshire, all that land in yellow is common land. All gone now. All gone, all disappeared. And of course, the celebration of these common lands is now um, widespread in the Scottish borders, where you have common riding festivals. And the common riding festivals are often reported to be something to do with flogging and stuff. Um, that's got something to do with some flags that we've. The fundamentals of the common riding is the people in the town getting on horseback and riding around the marches of the town's lands to make sure there'd be no encroachment from the big, powerful layers, Duke of Roxburgh, Duke of the Clue, Marcus of Lothian and those people, who cast covetous eyes on the town's lands, because in a royal borough, if you own land, you have a vote. Um, so the common good ridings are in procession now, but they owe their origin, and they still go around the marches of the common lands. I mean, if you go to Wardour or, 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 or Elrose or Hoyt, that's what they actually uh, do. They ride around uh, the perimeter of the historic common lands of the town. Some of these don't exist anymore, but there's still some quite extant areas. <coughs> You've got a place like Aberdeen. Um, this is one of the areas where Bruce actually granted a charter to the city of Aberdeen because they were very helpful at the Battle of Bannockburn, and he granted them so called Freedom Land charters. And there's a number of these Freedom Land charters granted by Bruce in the aftermath of um, uh, Bannockburn. 
And this was land extended to 14 miles in circumference around the medieval city, Royal Borough of Aberdeen. Vast estate in land. Most of which is now gone through rampant municipal nepotism and corruption. Um, but this is one of the boundary stones that marks the historic boundaries uh, of the so-called Freedom Lands. 75, I think, 80 of these stone markers. Um, the heart of the city of Edinburgh, the new town, uh, was acquired by the Common Good Fund from Harriet's Hospital, and the people that now run the Harriet School, um, 35 acres in 1769, uh, was it earlier, um, bought by the Common Good Fund. And that means the day that every piece of land that hasn't been sold in the new town, so the streets have never been sold, for example, belongs to the Common Good Fund. <coughs> which gives us a lot of kind of entertaining campaigns. The local council making sure that, for example, all the table and chair licences that are granted, all the uh, gearish events that are now seem to be increasing uh, in, in Edinburgh, that the revenue from the rent of that, if they're occupying the streets, as they typically do in terms of in, in, in George Street, etc., goes to the Common Good Fund, because that land still does belong to the Common Good. And the common lands of the town led to lots of disputes in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, from the kind of fisher women of Eyemouth who fought a long legal battle to retain the rights to bleach linen uh, and to dry fish in the village of Eyemouth, to celebrate cases like the Rabbit Wars in St Andrews. And that's when the town went bankrupt in the late 18th century and decided to lease its valuable Pilmure Lynx um, to a rabbit farmer called Mr Dempster. Uh, the Pilmure Lynx even then were being used for golf. Obviously they are now the famous St Andrews Lynx. Um, and the problem with leasing a golf course to a rabbit farmer <laughs> is that the 18 holes and the limited number of bunkers uh, sort of multiply. And that led to physical confrontation between golfers who were armed with pretty decent weapons, um, <laughs> irons, and rabbit wardens who were armed with um, pointed sticks. Um, and blood was shed on a number of occasions, um, the case went to the House of Lords. Eventually, a local landowner bought out the lease gave it back to the town um, and the peace was restored until, of course, the abolition of town councils in 1975 when the good burgers and St were so shocked at the idea that their links would end up with the Marxist Republic of North East Fife District Council uh, that they got a private act of parliament passed as an Andrews Links Trust Act, which is put into uh, a trust. Uh, so this, the whole, the, uh, the, the, the common lands of the town have been the subject of widespread uh, legal actions over the years um, and it would be central to the, the whole point of granting towns and boroughs common lands was to provide people with areas to graze, uh, to, 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 uh, to bleach linen, to do all the kind of normal things. In fact, the things that went on in parish commons were extensive. People gathered uh, food, they gathered uh, peats, um, they brewed illicit and distilled illicit material, uh, sectarian preaching, um, extramarital affairs, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> And um, people needed a little bit of peace and quiet to do um, this um, on, the, on the commons. The sixth land grab, of course, is when we kind of ran out of land here and we went over and we stole all of these countries. Um, and that was, you know, led by Captain Cook in 1770. We'll come back to him in a minute. Um, he actually was sent out on a scientific expedition to um, plot the transit of Venus from Tahiti. So he was on his way to Tahiti um, to do a scientific um, exercise in and um, Venus went. But he was given secret orders by the Apple to, to claim and occupy and proclaim in the name of the crown any land that he discovered that he already owned um, in the view of the British uh, by anybody, which is why they landed in Queen's Land, that became Queen's Land, um, and he declared a British. Um, and uh, similarly, elsewhere uh, in the globe, not necessarily Hong Kong, China, India. Africa, which is all carved up by the um, Berlin Conference in um, 1862, I think that was. But um, although Captain Cook and the British claimed Australia, there's been a fight back. Um, and this is a, a, an interesting case called the Marble case. Um, so this is Eddie Marble on the left, who lives in the Torres Strait. He's now dead. And we lived in the Torres Strait uh, off the north coast of Queensland. And when the Queensland government wanted to build a hospital or an airstrip or some public works, and they sought to acquire the land necessary for his public works. And he objected to this, and he worked as a gardener in the University of Townsville in North Queensland. And he was a very intelligent man, he was very well educated, and he spent his lunchtime with a history professor and a politics professor. 
And they got talking about this airstrip or hospital or whatever it was. And he said, you know, this land doesn't belong to me in the South Wales. This is our land. This has been in our people, with our people, the many of people, since time immemorial. And they said, don't silly Eddie, you know, this is, you know, that's all the strange stuff. He said, no, no, this is our land. The Crown has no right to this land. Never has any had right to this land. And he built up support and took a famous case, the Marble case versus Cleveland. Um, and eventually he won. Uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, he was dead by the time the final judgment came from the Supreme Court. Um, but the Supreme Court came down with a verdict that said the lands in the Murray Islands is not Crown land. Um, so when the Crown went to Australia and said it's all terra nullius, nobody lives here, nobody's land, and the Crown belongs to it, the court said no. 250 years later, they said no. The Marian people are entitled against the whole world to the possession, occupation, use, and enjoyment of the lands in the Murray Islands. That was a really important judgment. Um, now that's, uh, that, that, that the sound's not going to work on that, but that's a little clip um, from the uh, Prime Minister of Australia who went on television, or went on the radio, the morning after the Marble Junction. It was so important. I had a hot phone with people all over Australia complaining about the fact that uh, these folk had won this famous case. And it had repercussions all over the, the New World. It's like this incarnation, of course, was um, the little woman that I write about in the book. Uh, the last act of colonial acquisition of the British government was the colonisation of Rockall, which is a small island in the North Atlantic. Uh, we were worried that the Soviets would put some stuff on it to try and run missile testing during the Cold War, which we still do, I think, for South years. Um, and the Admiralty went to the, what was then the colonial office and said, how do you, how do you claim land as your own? Um, they said, well, you colonise it, and they were actually busy decolonising at that time, but it said, if you, you want to go for it, we just do the same as we've always done. Um, and the report is that they actually got Captain Cook's charter from the Queen, okay, I can't remember what was the Royal Warren, and they, they drafted a modern one, gave it to Captain O'Connell and HMS Vidal, and said, go and claim Rockall. So they went, um, they couldn't land on the first day, um, this is the plaque they left, um, they had to edit the date on the plaque because they couldn't land on the day they intended to. Um, but they hoisted a flag, there was a 21 gun salute, um, and they proclaimed Rockall by authority of the National Criminal and the Grace of God, realms, territories, queens, defenders, etc. Um, and of course, Rockall is the centre of the dispute now, who does really own Rockall, but um, Britain tried to fortify that claim by passing the Rockall Act in 1972, uh, which quickly says that it shall be incorporated into that part of the United Kingdom known as Scotland and shall form part of the district of Harris in the county of Inverness. And all of Scotland shall apply according to that, in case anyone will live in a rock hall and needs to know where it's a black hole. Or... And so this whole process of kind of land, this takes us right back to Robert Bruce, takes us right back to the early medieval period, um, going out and, and conquering land. So now why does all this matter? I'm just going to skip through some areas about why land governance uh, really matters. And I'll do that quite quickly because I see where the tip has been here. Um, one of the most interesting campaigns I was ever involved with was the controversy over the sale of the Coolum Mountains in Sky in 2000. Um, so this arose as a consequence of the Chief of Clan MacLeod, John MacLeod, who owned a castle <coughs> and a leaky roof. Uh, the roof had been repaired, I think, by his mother, Dame Flora, uh, uh, or his aunt, I think it wasn't, she was some distant person. We had to change his name to MacLeod in order to become the heir of the state. And the title and achieved them. But anyway, she'd, 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 um, she'd uh, there's a flat roof this castle, and she'd um, put copper or something on it. Anyway, the guys are leaked like mad. So he needed about 20 million to do up his castle, so he thought, well, I'll just sell the mountains. And um, this generated a huge foolery. People said, how can you sell the coolants? How can anyone own the coolants? To which the answer was, well, just say, well, you can own it, it's a land, just with some mountains on it, it doesn't make any difference. But the question then was, well, the cloud really own it? Well, what's his title? Uh, so a number of us began investigating, we found some titles like this, uh, which were latter from the late 16th century, um, talking about the Barodium of Glenelg, Cum Turi Forticurio, Manorie, Locum, Molendis, Pastoris, Doctus, Croftus, Partibus, Pendiculus, Annexus, Connexus, etc. Well, it's translated, and uh, we found that what MacLeod actually had was, I think, was called eight or ten unseats of land in Brackadale. And an unsafe land in the 16th and 17th century was the area of land that was an ounce of silver, hence unsafe of silver and rent. So an unsafe land in East Lothian would get a relatively small amount of land, because land in East Lothian is valuable. An unsafe land in Sky would be quite large here. So it wasn't an aerial measure, it was a measure of the economic value of the land. And we concluded that no one would ever have paid an ounce of silver for the actual coons themselves, because they're an iron rocky waste for nothing. 
So we argue that Bunsby had a reasonable claim, perhaps, to all the sort of pasture lands in Brackett if he didn't actually own uh, Coolum. Um, anyway, we didn't succeed, but what we did succeed on was stopping and selling them. So never sold them because all these purchasers said, well, wait a minute, I want to make sure I haven't paid 20 million for some rifles that I really own them. Um, and the keeper of the register couldn't get any guarantee either because there was no recorded title. So she just said, well, you know, I don't know, I'll, I'll deal with them when I get an application. Um, so everyone kind of went away. Um, other cases when I was at University of Aberdeen, I met this lovely lady, Jean Bain, in the top right. Um, anyone know who the woman in the bottom right is? Selena Scott, yes, Grampian Television. Oh, this was her making a programme about Jean Bain and her son, uh, Rob Bain. And what was interesting about Jean was um, she lived in a farm in Deeside, just outside Balter. And she was the last native speaker of Deeside Gaelic. Deeside Gaelic was a fascinating language because it was kind of infused with Dalek and Norse, and it was separate, separated by the Coolers, by the Coolers, by the Coolers. Um, for most of the other of the Gale Tax, so it had developed its own kind of particular dialect of Gaelic. And she was the last native speaker, she died in 1992, so Deeside Gaelic is a dead language. And, and one of the reasons it died was because Aberdeenshire here um, was never included in the Crofting counties. When Crofters got their property rights, their security tenure in 1886, uh, they wanted to apply to the whole of Scotland. So anyone with a small holding paid less than five shillings a year uh, and the various other qualifying criteria. Uh, across the whole of Scotland meant to benefit from the 1886 uh, Crofting Act. But the big powerful landowners, and remember the whole of the law of Scotland on property has been developed and passed by landowners, because they were the people that legislated, and men. Right? So male landowners um, have basically developed the fundamentals of a property rights system, because they sat in the House of Commons and the Lords. Until 1833, the Reform Act, out of our franchise, the three franchise acts. It's only property owners. Even after that, it's just property owners to the for that. And it took another 50 years for women to get forward. So most of the laws of Scotland have been developed to protect the interests of the people who own the land themselves. And so the members of the House of Lords, the big part of the said, well, not having property tenure across the whole of Scotland. And they tried to devise all sorts of fixes as to how they could restrict it to what they saw as the troublesome northern counties and the highlands. And they couldn't devise a formula that excluded the rest of Scotland. So they said, well, it only apply in those counties that the Napier Commission, which was set up by the government to inquire into the situation with Crofters, uh, actually took evidence. Um, and that was the, what's now called seven Crofting counties. And it excluded Aberdeenshire. They never took evidence in Aberdeenshire. But interestingly, the first session of the Napier Commission took place in Edlodia. Edlodia is excluded from the Crofting Act. Anyway, the point is, people with small holdings in Aberdeenshire never had the protection of the Crofting Act. So they could be evicted relatively straightforwardly, and they were. And so people like Jean Bain, had she lived in Invernessia or Rosshire, had this been part of Invernessia, she'd be a crofter. And all her neighbours would be crofters. And today there'd be lots of people living there with crofting rights. But there weren't. So not only did the land um, get appropriated in the hands of the big estates, but the people themselves disappeared. Not just did the people themselves disappear, but the culture disappeared with it, which notably a whole language, which was a living language for a long time, is dead, directly as a consequence of our land tenure uh, laws. Um, and then her farms put on the market and bought by someone in London. <coughs> the other main reason why land matters today is because of something we all need and require is, is housing. Um, and we see now, you know, 30 years ago, um, the, um, the ratio of your income to house prices were somewhere in the region of two to three times. So, you could buy a house for about two or three times your annual income. So the average income today is 27,000. You could buy a house for uh, 80,000 pounds. Nowadays, the ratio is more like eight, nine, and 10. And the reason for that is not that housing has become more expensive. In fact, if anything, housing has become cheaper. Uh, and this graph shows earnings and building costs at the bottom. They've received adjusted for inflation relatively stable. And so the actual costs of building a house in real terms are not much more than they were 50 years ago. But what has changed is the line at the top, which is land prices. Land prices have rocketed. And that's one reason why housing is so unaffordable uh, in Britain today, is because of uh, land prices. And it's also because of the model of new housing provision, which is uniquely in Europe, dominated by speculative volume housing developers. As we are, no other country in Europe does that. Uh, they typically have 50, 60, 70 percent rates of self procurement. So people buy their own pots of land and commission their own builders to build stuff. 
Um, whereas in Britain, we've got these volume specul speculative volume house builders who principally compete with each other to get land. So the company, whether it's Barrett's or any of the other ones, who gets the land, gets to build. And those who get the land are those willing to pay the most for the land, so there's a bidding war goes on for the land. And so developer two here gets the land. But you're selling houses into a market which is, broadly speaking, people can afford between them certain parameters, you know, because it used to cost so much in Glasgow or in uh, or in Fish and Galway. And that's the price that your final product's going to be at. So if you spend a lot more on land, you have much, much less to spend on actually building houses. So typically what takes a squeeze is not the profit, um, but are things like affordability and infrastructure provision and certainly build quality. And that's why a lot of modern houses are frankly rubbish. Absolutely rubbish. And they've got design lives of less than 60 years. So people buying new houses or new housing estates today will barely pay their mortgage up for the design line. <coughs> That's no way to build. Um, and the main reason for that is because of land prices. The land prices were much, much lower. If you could buy a plot of land to build a house for £10,000, you could spend all the rest of the money on building a high quality, energy efficient, carbon neutral, long lasting uh, house. I and mean, if you look at the index of prices between Germany and the UK, for example, blue is residential price is um, indexed in Germany. So basically today, the price of housing in Germany indexed back to 1970 is basically the same price levels in 1970. The price of housing in Britain, however, you can see the red line, has massively increased. And one of the reasons that Germany is a richer country than Britain is because people are not pouring all the money into buying houses and paying mortgages to finance companies. They don't actually do anything for the economy. They just enrich as banks and shareholders to finance institutions. Whereas in Germany, they're not paying large well sums of money for housing costs, so for earnings, they spend and invest in the local economy, which generates jobs and economic activity, which pays high wages, which generates high taxes. So it's a much more virtuous circle. And property and land prices are at the heart and all that. And that means in Germany, they have a wonderful urban design. Um, and typically, the municipality in Germany will buy land at its existing use value. So if it's farmland at £1,000 an acre, they'll buy it at £1,000 an acre. Um, and build high quality um, homes on it. Even on the bottom left here, this is social housing. These people are earning more in the feed-in tariffs for solar panels than they're paying rent. Right, this is social housing, but they're paying all the rent out of the income they're generating from generating electricity. Um, so this is genuine housing, which has to be affordable, high quality, energy efficient for the people. That's what housing should be. Whereas Britain's developed a model of housing which is about speculation, about wealth accumulation and the very inequality, which we all know about today. Germany's got wonderful policies and things like allotments. We have allotments that are limited to, I don't know, like um, 10 metres by 10 metres. And we still have Victorian laws that says you can't spend the night in your allotment. Well, it'll be hard to anyway because there's actually no room. <laughs> Germany, but a sugar garden. This is a German allotment. This is wonderful. All through the summer, the kids are living here. The aunties, the grannies, the grandpas are all coming here for weeks, etc. And this is a little green oasis for all the working classes in Germany cities, and this started in the, in the 19th uh, century. I'll skip over um, this. The other lesson we can learn from Europe, of course, is we've got a much more pluralistic pattern of land ownership in continental Europe. So this is two graphs looking at the, the, the percentage of whole land holdings, forestry land holdings, in different classes. So at the top there, you can see that um, over 40%, 45%, of forest holdings, of the acreage of forest holdings in Scotland are owned in holdings of over 100 hectares. So big. The distribution in 19 European countries is completely the opposite. So 60% of forest holdings are held in holdings of less than a hectare. And the principal reason for that is because in continental Europe following the revolution and the Napoleonic Code, children have the legal right to inherit land. And that's meant that over 200 years, land parcels have got smaller. Whereas in Scotland today, children have no legal right to inherit land. So if I own land or property and I have children, I can disinherit them and give all my property to the end of the There's nothing my children can do about that. That's a bizarre law and uh, it's been perpetuated in Britain by the landed class. The last thing they want to do is even allow all the children an equal right to inherit land. And remember, we only abolished primogeniture, uh, the eldest son shall inherit in 1967. So succession laws are a key reason why you have a much more pluralist pattern of land in, in, in continental Europe. It also means that if you've got lots and lots of owners, like forest owners, 
No one of them is going to be able to make a great living out of their forestry products, so they're going to be the So 51,000 foreign foreign forest owners in Sweden set up Sertra, a massive cooperative, um, and it's the third largest producer of wood pulp in the world. Um, uh, Britain farmers, for example, um, they wanted, uh, it was difficult to get our Brussels sprouts and our broccoli to Paris. They thought, well, then, I, we can see land over there, that's England, what about it? selling it to England? Um, so they pulled the money, they bought some boats, um, exported the produce to England, and that's Brittany Ferries. And Brittany Ferries is still 57% owned by small French farmers. So the idea that small holdings are uneconomic is absolute nonsense, because once you get together and what's called vertically integrate, so you're not just selling raw produce, you own the factory that's processing the produce, you own the bank, um, typically things like Credit Agricole in France, you own the bank that provides the finance, you own the marketing and distribution, you own the processing uh, into forest products of the company, so you're getting income from all up and down uh, the value stream. Or Finland, Mexico, cooperative, 125,000 people own this company. So the biggest companies in the world in forestry are owned by tiny little landowners. And that's what European land ownership has allowed. I just a few things on tax and stuff. I mean, some of you remember there was a big fire in Glasgow, in a co-op building, <coughs> south end of the Kingston Bridge, just at the east side. Morrison Street, thank you. Um, <laughs> I got intrigued by this, and the first question I also ask is, who owns this? <laughs> and it turned out it was owned by a company um, called the Strathairn Property Development Company, based in Belfast. They bought it, I think it was 2013, it went in fact, sometime around there. They bought it 10 years earlier. They did nothing with it. The building was just falling into disrepair. Because it was an empty industrial building, it was exempt from our domestic rates. So they bought it, did nothing with it, um, when a fire breaks out of it, and what do they do? Well, of course, they rely on the fire brigade, which is funded by our taxes, to come and put the fire out. They relied on the police force to maintain public order in the streets around it. Uh, they rely on the court system, which we all pay for from our taxes, to adjudicate any uh, disputes. Um, and yet they paid no money whatsoever to the city of Glasgow to run those kind of services. And that's fundamentally why all property owners should pay tax. Because ultimately, the, um, the value that is imbued in property and land is only actually notional, and it depends on the state giving you that protection. It depends on the state giving you a legal system that defines your rights, a court system that's there to adjudicate. If you've got buildings, emergency services to put out fires. Um, ultimately, and this comes in countries of conflict, a defence force to protect your property rights if your country's ever defended. Because the first thing the Serbs did in Bosnia was burn the land registry. So what you do when you invade a country, you destroy people's property rights. Once you've destroyed people's property rights in law, it becomes very difficult for the population of that country to reclaim them. Um, and again, the state provides that ultimate guarantee that the thing that you think is yours actually is yours. You're not doing that yourself. You don't have your own little legal system, you don't have your own little fire brigade, you don't have your own little legal system. And that's why all property owners should pay tax to the local administration who provide most of the services and the infrastructure that support. Um, and I, I also got to do some study on land taxes and I was looking at Denmark and um, it was kind of interesting because the man on the top right, Mr. Anders Paulson, who's now the second largest landowner in Scotland, he's doing some thousand acres of land. In Scotland. Denmark has got property taxes and land taxes. And interestingly, they were running a campaign at the time to persuade Danes who own property overseas, typically holiday cottages in the cost of Sol or whatever, to pay tax on them because you're liable for them too. If you live in Copenhagen, you pay property tax on your land in Denmark and your summer house in the Yarmouth coast, but you're also liable for all the property you own overseas. You have to pay it to the local commune. So I contacted um, SCAT, who the Danish tax authorities, and say, like, there are something like 30,000 Danes who own property in Britain, in the UK. How much tax are you deriving from property in the UK? And they gave me a figure of something in the region of 580,000 kroner. That's 58,000 pounds. Well, that's nonsense. I said, I know the identity of the owners of 290,000 acres of land in Scotland are Danish citizens. And maybe we could come to some kind of deal here. I'll get maybe a call. <laughs> and then they got rid of suspicious and ran away. But it's bizarre that Anders Paulson is paying tax on his land holdings in Scotland which were he a Scot, he would not be paying. And ironically, he's not paying it to Highland Council or Aberdeenshire Council. 
is paying it to Esbjerg commune in Denmark to build beautiful nurseries for children uh, in the bottom hill. So this all matters how we tax uh, land us, get that into our preserving out of time. And finally, just some lessons from Europe, because what this tells us as well is fundamentally this is about democracy. If you go to the town of Lutherstadt, Wittenberg, which is where Luther pinned his thesis to the church door, he didn't have to pin his thesis, I don't think that's enough, but anyway, the Reformation was launched by Luther. He wasn't just a, a theologian and a, a reformer in that sense, he was also a political revolutionary. Because what he did, as well as saying, look, don't obey what the church of Rome uh, tells you to do, uh, we're going to have a reformed church where people have got the right to speak directly to God. Um, we're also going to stop paying our tithes and taxes to the church in Rome. Why should they claim the money from this little village of Wittenberg? So he persuaded the town council to set up a common good chest. And this is it. Literally, this is Wittenberg's common good chest, which is in the Lutherstadt Museum, in the museum. And into this we'll pay the tithes, the tenths of money from property owners in Wittenberg. So this is the birth of European local democracy and municipalism. And this money, this rent, this tax, instead of going to Rome or going to the church representatives in, in Saxony, it's went to the town. And the town used it to give um, bursaries to young people from the town to go and study university, and also to set up a fund to support widows and orphans. So this was the birth of social security as well. And it all came out of the Reformation. And it's the reason why today the local matters in continental Europe France has 36,000 communes. Uh, the Spanish municipios as well, 40,000, 50,000 um, uh, local uh, authorities. All of which are taxing the local population, typically taking the same kind of property taxes they've been taking for hundreds of years. And if you look at European municipal government, you find that France has got a ridiculous amount of municipalities with an average po the median population of 380 years. But 34 French communes that nobody else has got. Uh, there's about another 40 or 50 communes where the population is less than 50. There's some communes where only five people, but uh, nevertheless, they're a product of the French Revolution, and we're not going to get rid of them. Um, but you can see here that for the lowest level of government we're talking about here, Scotland's only got 32. So a country like Norway, for example, the same population has got 500, but 431 local authorities, with about 4,000 people living in it. So they actually have local government in continental Europe. We do not have local government anymore since we've got parishes, since we've got town councils, and since we've got the districts. We do not have anything that resembles local government. We have got large scale regional government. Apart from the cities, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Edinburgh, have got the same kind of royal boroughs they've always had in the boundaries of crypto. But they're basically the same. With the exception of that, we do not have uh, local government. If Scotland still had its town councils, 290 of them or so, 190 of them, Still had its parish councils, which were abolished in 1930. We had 871 municipalities with a median population of about 5,000 square kilometers. That would put us with peaksy peaksy in Europe. We'd be normal. Uh, we're not normal. We're very abnormal. I if you look at the typical Norwegian commune, for example, this is Hemsdal commune, uh, population 2,200. Income tax in Norway is 28%. 12.8% goes to the commune. 2.65% goes to the county. 12.44% goes to national government in Oslo. In a population of 2,200, when you go shopping, picking up your kids from school, uh, go to watch the football on a Saturday morning, um, go to the library, you will meet and bump into, literally bump into, the people that are spending um, half the income tax you pay. And what that does is it builds accountability. Because you say, me, um, why, why, why are you doing that with my money? And that's all done in a very informal way, a very kind of social way, as it were, um, and it builds a much greater sense of powerful resilience in the local population because they are responsible for many more of the things that go on. And the people that are elected to public office are accountable to people they are meeting on a daily basis. Historically, what we've done for our income tax is send it to London. You know, we have modern communications and email and stuff, but historically it's been impossible to hold to account someone who's saying 500 miles away in, in London. Which is why most taxes should go to the local. That's the first place you should go. Then you remit up what the region needs, then you remit up what the national needs. That's an ideal system. We've got the opposite. So Land Reform today covers a wide range of topics. Land is central to issues around um, transparency, offshore tax havens, um, short-term lets, Airbnb, which I've been campaigning on, uh, property taxes, uh, the rights you've got as private rented uh, tenants, agricultural holdings, 
uh, who owns or doesn't own and all owns the rights to wild animals, uh, planning law, which is a system of nationalization of development rights, inheritance succession we just talked about, things like trust ports, there's 60 ports in Scotland that are social enterprises, Victorian social enterprises, the law around compulsory purchase, that started when we wanted to build railways in Britain. And the idea that if you wanted to build a railway in Britain, that you had to go out and negotiate with every single landowner, that London and Northeast Railways would have to go out and negotiate with every single landowner from London to Edinburgh to build a great Northeastern railway was, was a ludicrous notion. No one was going to do that. So what did we do? We introduced effective and compulsory purchase. We passed an act of parliament that said, sorry, we're going to lose all our land and blind the children of the railway. Um, and compulsory purchase stays with us today, obviously, it's an important tool in being able to typically build things like uh, railways. I think like the Crown Estate, the Crown Lands of Scotland, we've moved to all them now and the questions of access to the management. So land and its governance penetrates virtually all aspects of public policy, but it's what I call kind of arch the, the, the archaeology of power. It's deep down there, it's hidden by other layers, and we seldom actually get to interrogate the actual power that sits behind land in order to be able to ask sensible questions about should we change the very fundamentals of power as opposed to sort of tinkering. Uh, at the surface. And ultimately, this is a question of place and power. I grew up in a village, a town called Kenos in Kenosha. Uh, this is the town hall. It's now riddled with uh, dry rocks. It's been demolished and the houses there. There is no town council in Kenos. When I lived there, there was not only a town council, there was a county council. Uh, we were heaving with local politicians. Uh, but there was accountability. But my father wanted to put some sets on the street so we wouldn't get knocked out and in the street where our front door literally opened straight onto the street. Um, he wants to put some sets there to sort of pretend that that was really part of the street. He's got the office, talks to the boys, so they are. Um, these things got done, and there's a bit of nepotism, a bit of corruption, a nail. Um, but the point is we had a local institution, and you know, I went to to Kumar's Folk Festival here, heard Ali Bain, uh, then a young man with a very sort of stiff high street jacket and a tie, playing a fiddle with his tutor. Uh, 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 Tom Anderson, etc. But now the heart of these communities is gone. There's no political decision making, there's no accountability, uh, they're not taxing the local population, they're not collecting the taxes. It's all now done very, very remotely uh, in a place called Perth. Um, which, if you're a normal European in France or Denmark or Italy, is bizarre that you would run Kinross from Perth. It's like no Italian or French person would understand why you want your town run from even 30 miles away. So fundamentally, this is about people, it's about power, uh, and it's about place. Um, I hope you know more about it, the book's still on sale. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>